mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Technology can shape growth. Help us be more agile. We can use technology to change, disrupt the landscape of the industries that we participate in. Building technology so that others can build technology and make things happen. Our success is not dependent on our products. It's dependent on the success that our customers, our partners have with our products. It's really not about our ambitions, but it's the application of our ambitions so that we can deliver digital transformation. I want you to envision what difference can you make to shape the world. Good morning, partners. This is Sherman Krantzer, Senior Partner Channel Development Manager for Microsoft. And I want to say thank you for joining us this morning on the panel, Strategies from the Titans of Sales and Industry. We are so fortunate uh, today to uh, have a great partner uh, in studio in Chicago uh, that is really going to to help us understand verticals, understand uh, how they are becoming uh, titans within their own industry, right? Becoming that, we talk about the you know 500 pound gorilla within a certain vertical, and, and this is really gonna be great because we're gonna ask a lot of really thought-provoking questions. Uh, we're gonna be able to learn something and take away something uh, today that I do believe you're gonna be able to implement uh, into your practice very quickly. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the introductions. We do know that uh, we do know uh, that uh, we have um, uh, Terry Isinger is out today, but my name is Sherman Krancer. You know who I am, Partner Channel Development Manager uh, for Microsoft. Uh, and in studio today, we have Eric Klaus. Hey, Eric, would you mind just introducing yourself and what you do? Hey everybody, this is Eric Klaus. We've gotten to know each other a little bit over the past weeks, but uh, you probably are aware that I provide outsourced VP of sales and marketing services for many IT companies uh, around the, uh, the channel. Perfect, thank you so much, Eric. And um, you know, do we have uh, uh, Tim Tetrick uh, on the line or Jeff Stoffel? Okay, well let's go over to Thomas Oseguera. Thomas. Thomas is actually out today skiing. And we are striking out. All right, so let's get it over to Chicago. Hey, uh, Jason, pass it over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Jason Hinton. I'm the Partner Development Manager in Illinois, and I'm in studio with Rick. Rick, do you mind, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Rick Reitz. I'm the Director of Consulting Services at DMC here in Chicago. Uh, we've got about 135 people at Chicago's headquarters, but we've got offices also in New York, Denver, Boston, Houston, and St. Louis. Awesome. Thanks, Rick, for coming in today. We're excited to have him in studio, and I uh, think it's going to be a great show. Sherman? All right. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and get into the agenda uh, today. Uh, we have, you know, the thing that we always focus on is, you know, growth, uh, or concept, really, then growth, simplify, optimize, repeat, uh, profitability, and lastly, uh, partner back office. Uh, we have another great um a great uh, video from uh, the, the, our partners, the great Terry and Thomas, TNT. All right, so let me go ahead and pass it back over to, um, to Jason. He's going to go into uh, the top 10 fastest growing Illinois partners. Jason? All right, everyone. Um, I have to say I was envious of Sherman last week. He was highlighting his top 10 partner growth. And so... Um, I'm really excited to, uh, and I've actually talked to some of the partners already this week and thank them for the growth. Uh, we've got Impact Networking at almost 400%, uh, Blue Star Technology at over 200%, Pavlov Media at over 184%. So we're excited. Um, I, you know, one of the things I was noting, because we had to do our slides for our bosses, is over half of my partners 
are at 20% growth or greater for this year, and I'm super appreciative of that. It's awesome. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Great. Thank you so sure very much on, here. Uh, all right. So section. let's go ahead and get into uh, growth. Why don't you go ahead and roll one? Okay, now we can hear you. We couldn't hear you before. All right, act one. So let's go ahead and get into the very first question. And, and we're going to send this out uh, actually to, to Jason really is, you know, how has your industry expertise helped you grow your customer base and relationship with Microsoft? Maybe Jason's partner who's in studio. Hey, thank you, Sherman. So one of the things that we've been talking about, and we just had an executive summit about it with some of our partners, is we've got to get specialized in terms of vid, uh, vertical and industry expertise. Rick uh, and DMC have done that already. They sort of grew up through the manufacturing space. And so, Rick, what would you say has helped you um, in terms of growing your industry and formalizing it, and how has that contributed to the Microsoft relationship? Yeah, it's, it definitely took a while. Uh, it didn't happen overnight. Um, and I think uh, you know, we've really emerged as a go-to partner, especially around IoT solutions uh, in the manufacturing space, as well as product manufacturers, people with ideas uh, looking to take those to market. Um, we partner a lot with a variety of different organizations, whether many of them are Microsoft partners. Um, when you look at something like an IoT solution, especially, there's a lot of pieces to it. So there's selecting the right hardware, um, stuff off the shelf. Um, we happen to have an in-house embedded design team, so we can actually design some of these sensors and chips in-house. But many times, there is stuff available out there. Um, that people might use even a Raspberry Pi for something sim simple. Um, figuring out your connectivity options, um, doing the IoT hub integration that's often required if you're going to choose Azure IoT as your platform. Um, there's infrastructure considerations, and we partner a lot there. We're not a managed service provider, so that Infrastructure is not our strong suit, so we work a lot with partners in that regard and, and setting up the IoT services. Even non-Azure IoT services are required sometimes. Um, mobile app development, web development, uh, workflow solutions, and those could be Dynamics 365 centric. Um, could be something like uh, field service being implemented. So we've got some expertise in each of these areas, but we're not very deep in all areas. And so we partner a lot. Um, then of course, there's the data analytics coming out the back end, and Power BI is a big part of that as well. Um, and I think with Microsoft, I think our partnership has really expanded quite a bit over the last 18 months, uh, especially. Um, I know we're partnering with a hardware manufacturer that makes PLCs, which are programmable logic controllers. They kind of control the manufacturing process. And uh, Microsoft's joining in, we're joining in as kind of a real world voice in, in how to implement IoT. So I think we've come a long way and it keeps getting stronger. Excellent. So, I mean, I think this is one of the aspects of the partner call that we really want to emphasize is the networking, right? So one thing Rick just talked about is they're not looking at the managed infrastructure piece. So if there's partners out there who have a, you know, and there's a lot who are talking about selling to the manufacturing vertical, if you need the hardware or you need the device or you need the integration, but you want to provide the infrastructure, there's partners like DMC that can help you with that. And also they're heavily um, involved with the Microsoft team locally around manufacturing as well as local industry groups. And I think those are also very key to building the practice and the relationship. Uh, Sherman, do you want to talk about the next one in terms of growth and vertical in your space? Great, great. Thank you so much. That, that's really good. So, you know, Eric, let me ask you really, you know, how has your industry expertise really uh, helped your customer base and relationship with Microsoft? Well, I, I think that, you know, the industry expertise, the, the fact that I've been part of the, the Microsoft ecosystem for, you know, the past 20 years, the relationships I've built around that, that's really what has driven our business. Um, by by going you know and, and working within the the community that exists out there that community that we've been a part of for for so long um, and that goes to the think the the message around verticalization uh, as well and the fact that you know that is where we focus uh, we're not trying to be all things to everyone uh, we're very focused in what we do Oh, great. You know, so, you know, our next question, and, and we're going to kind of just talk about this a little bit before we send it over to Chicago, really is, you know, what lessons would you share with other partners 
about building uh, an industry focus uh, or brand. And what I'd like to kind of just talk about here is we talk about this a lot, right? We actually talk about, um, okay, moving away from being everything to everyone uh, and, and actually focusing on one specific or two or even three verticals. And we say, hey, go to your accounts and look them up. But I, I just want to illustrate one specific thing that, that, um, that would make you just almost think twice about how you're, you're uh, you know, sending out uh, marketing and advertising. I was talking to uh, my good friend Shane Gilder down at Village Ideas uh, and last yesterday, and, and, I was, and I asked him, I said, well, how much would it cost you to do a Google AdWord on MSP San Diego, right? And I asked him, I said, I bet you it's 20 bucks. And he said, no, I bet you it's 50. And it really was 50, $50 for every click, right? But how about if you were to put in uh, M or engineering MSP or manufacturing MSP, manufacturing for IT, right? The cost per click, $2. Think about that. It's 10 times the revenue typically, 10 times the cost of um, marketing vertically than it is to market to everyone and everything. Jason, why don't we go ahead and pass it over to you? Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so Rick, uh, next question. What are the biggest challenges in developing a vertical or industry specialty? What, is, what have you seen? Yeah, I think, I think starting out, it's really trying to figure out what's unique about a particular industry. You've got to learn their lingo. Uh, people so they feel comfortable. They feel like you know their industry, at least a little bit. Every business is unique. So you're going to learn things that they don't expect you to know everything. Um, it's also really important to stay on top of industry trends. They start to look at you as, what are other people doing in this industry? Should we be doing this too? Um, and then eventually you get to, you know, doing enough projects in one industry, you start to develop uh, patterns. You see patterns of the solutions you're building, um, and then that can lead to a lot of things down the road that really improve profitability. Um, in our particular industry, um, we, our primary client is our place to start. So, IT is brought into the picture quite a bit later. Um, and so getting engaged with IT, uh, getting them on board with whatever you're doing, that can be a little bit of a challenge too. Um, and then finding time to actually build some reusable IP uh, frameworks, things you can reuse. So we always create these, we have an internal list of things we wanna not quite productize, but at least put it into a framework where we could bring it to the table for the next customer. Yeah. And we work on that a lot. And probably the last challenge I'd add would be sometime, you know, we don't only work in manufacturing. So sometimes when we get a lead or, a, you know, someone refers us, if that company's not in manufacturing, our website could be a turn. Like, how could they know our industry? So that's just something to be aware of. You can get pigeonholed. So that's a little bit of a challenge. No, that's awesome. So a couple of things I want to hit on that Rick talked about that I think are really, really important is there are, there's tribal knowledge that doesn't get out, doesn't get socialized, and it's not formalized. So sometimes you have all this expertise working with customers, but you're not getting it to that point where you're productizing and using it. Um, secondarily, I think one of the other big challenges is you're busy selling and doing business and trying to make money, and so you don't spend time on packaging up, doing the other things that you need to do. Um, so I think it's key. So some of the motions that we're going through with you guys as part of the partner profitability plan that talked about some, that some people have a 30, 60, 90 day plan. This is coming where we're going to look at how your website represents who you are, how people are, and also how we're going to interact and help you pitch. Because I think just as Rick's talking about, I've, I've actually talked about package solutions. Hey, we should do this. This will be fun. And he's like, no, we do everything custom. And then he calls me and he goes, hey, uh, we're going to package and uh, <laughs> present with Microsoft. Like, awesome. Exactly. Um, I'll send it back to you guys. Uh, Kurt, any thoughts? Great. So, you know, um, actually, Jason, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we're getting a little bit of feedback on, on our end from, from your end. Uh, if you can increase the volume and then also uh, take a look at uh, the IM I just sent you. Um, so the next one really was is, is let me ask you this, Eric. You know, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges in developing a vertical or uh, industry speciality? Uh, is it, you know, could it, could it possibly be, um, you know, taking that risk, the jump? Or, I mean, what, what do you think? You know, I think that the, are there some risks? Perhaps, but I, the, one of the things that I, I talk to my partners that I work with about is uh, what's the bigger risk of not doing this? 
Um, I think this is something that every partner can do. It really comes down to taking a look at your customer base and just picking out some of the ones in there where you've got some success stories. Hopefully you've got something that you've done that's repeatable around that. Um, it could be manufacturing, uh, it can be you know, virtually anything. I, I have a, a partner that I've worked with where they're focused here in California in the entertainment industry and there's some really important security things that are going on in the entertainment industry today. Um, similar things with the aerospace and defense industry and I know we had a great partner in just a couple of weeks ago who's focused in that vertical. So it really comes down to you know making some internal decisions around it but once once you figure it out for yourself and you know you don't need to have 20 clients or 50 clients in an industry if you can pick out two or three good clients in an industry that's a starting point that's the starting point that you can begin to leverage from the marketing standpoint you've got a story to tell at that point and you can begin to go from there in terms of how you expand on that vertical industry that's some really, really great in insight, and I think that that's really good. You know, um, let, let's let's go ahead and ask you know our partner in, Ch in Chicago. How did you develop a vertical expertise uh, in manufacturing? Help us understand that. Yeah, so really, the roots of our company are in factory automation solutions. So things like PLCs, HMIs, data systems. Um, and our, actually, our number one partner is Siemens. Um, National Instruments and Microsoft close seconds. Um, but as we were delivering these engineering automation solutions to clients, a lot of them were asking us, hey, could you help us with that control? Uh, we need some standard operating procedures uh, put under some strict processes. Um, so all these workflow solutions and document management solutions drove us to start developing SharePoint. And SharePoint's probably the number one thing my team does. Um, and DMC's automations a uh, typical client is an engineering um, And so they started to measure things. Uh, they like to measure things and Power BI was a good fit. So we developed the Power BI practice. Uh, we began to see, as I mentioned earlier, some patterns in the solutions we're delivering, uh, document management, ISO, uh, standard operating procedure approval workflows, ideation workflows, products, employee onboarding. That's been one we developed for manufacturing, and we've been able to apply it to every single company, you know, every every single industry. Onboarding a, a, a new client or a new employee requires a lot of the similar tasks. By a lot of um, so we just became very quick and efficient at finding these kinds of solutions. Um, we've also found it's helped on the sales side a lot. Because clients don't like having to think too hard about what that they're trying to do. They can see something and say, that's really good, but I need it to work this way and just a few little changes to it. Um, so we've been very measured about the fact that what we're bringing to the table is a framework and not a software product. Um, we're not built to be a software company, but we at least have this core solution we bring to the table that's somewhat easy to modify. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, it really, if you're thinking about it, it's how do you get something that has higher margins, allows you to do more, and what problems does it solve, right? So that one of the things with the industry vertical, it's not doing it for the sake of doing it. It's figuring out what the business problem or the out or the solution and the outcome is going to be. And then engineering back to once you figure that out, then taking that and reselling it, simplifying it, reselling it to other partners in a similar industry. Um, Question really should be, and I'll, and I'll bring this back to you, is, is what type of trepidation did you have when developing the vertical expertise in, in, in manufacturing or kind of like going that direction. I think some of the partners probably want to know, know a little bit about that. Yeah, it's still either got to go all in, I guess, um, or be prepared that you're going to be pigeonholed by some, some, some prospects that you play. Um, so it is a bit of blind faith that it's going to work. Um, so I think you do have to be aware of most of our business comes looks from clients that are closest to us. So take a look at the market around you. Make sure there's a good base of that particular industry in your general geography. I think that will help a lot to boost your confidence in doing it. Um, and then putting some good marketing strategies behind it, holding events, uh, AdWords. We, get a, we invest quite a bit in AdWords. Uh, we don't have a sales team. Uh, 
which is kind of unique as well. We train our own engineers to do a lot of that, but it's maybe a story for another day. Um, but I, I think really understanding the local markets. Okay. Well, you know, I think it's, it's also having the space to be able to have the air pumping support to do what you're doing, right? A simple enough message that everybody can sell and then getting the message out there. But I mean, Sherman, the other thing I would say is you have to say no to some business. And I think yeah. there's some people who are trying to generate enough revenue and feel enough pressure there. They're not willing to say no to certain things as they're trying to specialize. Yeah. Now, Eric, let me ask you the, your opinion on this. Now, if you were to take you know, your current business, right, and you already have it, and you probably have some trepidation with moving right everything to engineering vertical. Yeah. What about creating a separate landing page? That's kind of a separate from your 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 actual website, right? But then generating all that social media to start, kind of start pointing them that way, kind of as a, a test or kind of a, a slow way of kind of do, you know making that move. What do you think? You can do that. Uh, there are some challenges around going that that path in terms of branding. So you know you have some some trade offs going that direction. But I'll share with you uh, another perspective that I've used in the past and I've seen some other partners use, which I think was absolutely brilliant. And that is that on their landing page, they actually created a you know a, a click through, if you will, that asked the person who was coming onto the page what industry they were coming from. So that, let's say you were coming in and it might ask you, hey, are you a manufacturer? Click here. Or are you a distributor? Click here. Or are you a professional services company? Click here. And it becomes sort of that, you know, that, that, you know, click through storytelling at that point, giving them information based on the industry that they're coming from and the industry verticals that we're trying to, to focus on. And I think that strategy works really well. The other thing that you can do with that also is start to capture some information about who that person is, what role they might play within the organization, and again, tailor your content to that individual at that point. You know, are they coming from the IT side of the house? Are they coming from the finance side of the organization? Um, are they coming from you know a manufacturing side potentially? So you know, these are things to to look at. How do we share that messaging? How do we provide messaging to that user uh, who's come to our website based on what they're looking for? Giving them content that's relevant to them. I think that's one of the other things that you can do and it allows your, your storytelling, uh, which is something I know we talk about here, uh, your storytelling to be much more personalized. That's great. That, that, that is really fantastic. All right, so let's go ahead and move to um, our next section. Uh, which is simplify, optimize, and repeat. All right, very good. All right, so the very first question, and we're going to send this back over to Chicago. You know, are there other industries that you look to build solutions for outside of manufacturing? And if so, uh, why? So Rick, are you looking for other industry solutions outside of manufacturing at this point? Or? Yeah, so we usually work with engineers at manufacturers. So that's been a natural evolution is to actually work with engineering consulting firms. So they're, they're kind of kind of competitors in some ways, yep. but not totally. Um, and they're always looking for, you know, business productivity solutions. And so we'll work together with them there. And I think in the future, uh, we're going to focus a lot more on professional services, uh, legal, recruiting, consulting, uh, hourly type of uh, professional services out there. Simply from the standpoint of we've invested heavily in our own internal systems mm -hmm. and being able to go and you know, instead of saying eat your own dog food, we like to say drink our own champagne. And that plays really, really well in a sales situation when you can demo your own system to a customer and say, no, this is a great solution. We use it and we love it. Um, and so that goes a long way. So I think professional services is probably our next, our next growth area. Well, you know, and we talk to partners all the time that have a professional services practice that it's either financial services or legal, or even sometimes it's a doctor's office or a clinic type of scenario. And what's interesting about them is if you look at the user group, it's a very similar need in terms of managed infrastructure. But the story behind it needs to be very different, right? So if it looks 
if you're trying to sell a legal solution to a healthcare firm or healthcare solution to a financial services firm, they won't take it. It doesn't look like them. They don't buy into it. It's just trying to sell technology. So one of the things that you know I'm really pushing my partners to do is I get told, hey, I want to build a SharePoint practice or a Dynamics practice. Well, what's that going to do? What's a business outcome going to be by building this practice? And I'll take that story across. Also, the engineering piece, that's what I'm encouraging people in terms of simplification. If you make your message simpler, the people who are talking to your customers, they actually can sell for you. But they don't have to feel like they're selling because they're just knowledgeable about this is what you guys do. They heard the problem. They connect the need. Now you have a lead. That's what I would love for more of my partners to take. So. Yeah, and I, I Jeremy, think. How about you guys? I, th I think you know one of the things that uh, we, we are missing here is the psychology of the buyer, right? And and them identifying with you as a client. I think you know we, we are all sitting there trying to become this MSP, the the managed service provider. However, if you were to take a look uh, at you know twenty managed service provider websites, and I would imagine a, a majority of the ones that are here on the call today, you wouldn't see very much differentiation. However, you know, the psychology of the buyer, when they come to your website, you know, they've kind of already understood that they want to buy, you know, 96%, I think that's the, the, the metric uh, that they want to, they want to buy already. But if you have something that's vertically specific on your website and they are, let's say an engineer, Right? They're going to automatically and psychologically feel more comfortable if you have a solution or you're talking about solving a problem within that industry. Right? Um, and, and I think that's, you know, it, it's pushing that customer, that consumer just over the edge to feel like I'm going to trust you. Because if your website says you specialize in engineers and you're bringing people, engineers, to, let's say, your website through social marketing and email marketing and all these different things that you're doing, you know, they're, they're, right away they look at you, they feel comfortable. If they look, then they say, well, I got to look at you know, another MSP. They click on that managed service provider and they're everything to everyone. Well, they don't feel comfortable because they feel like, well, wait a minute, this last one I just visited, they know what they're talking about. Eric, what do you think? No, Sherman, I, I totally agree uh, with everything you were just saying there. I think that, you know, that's incredibly, incredibly important. You know, Nobody comes to your website just on a, a random search, right? You know, nobody started the day looking for lawnmower repair and ended up on a managed services page. So, you know, they started out with a particular need of some kind. And so how we answer that question that's in the back of their mind, how we address the pain point that they have, that issue that caused them to get out there on the web and start that process of, of looking for a solution, you know, that's really the, the critical thing that we, we have to address today. And, you know, the more that we can address that from the standpoint of the specific need of that particular person, if it's manufacturing, as we've been talking about today, and an engineer who started that search, um, you're going to be speaking their language. You're going to be speaking their language in a way that tells them these folks get it. Whereas somebody who's just generically saying that, you know, we provide IT services, that's not necessarily relevant to them, especially in, in vertical industries. You know, one of the things we, we touched on a moment ago, when you're dealing with legal or you're dealing with medical, um, it, you have compliance issues in those industries. You have compliance issues in manufacturing, especially in some of the sub-verticals within manufacturing like defense and aerospace. So how you address compliance issues for them tells them you understand the unique challenges of their industry even more so than somebody who is just generically saying, we provide services. Good, good, good. So Rick, let me ask, you know what, uh, let's say, ha have you been able to capture the, you know, the, 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 the tribal knowledge per se? Uh, you know, from your vertical, um, you know, expertise or, you know, w you know your vertical um, uh, markets that you've been putting together. Help us understand, you know, how that's, you know, translating into new business and new margin. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do a lot of lunch and learns, uh, a lot of kind of almost like verbal case studies. We try to tr put them on the website too, but it's it's more about sharing the knowledge from different projects, different challenges that were experienced. And, and those of you maybe in oil and gas would know there's something called a pig. I didn't know what a pig was. I, got a question. I learned that from a, and I don't even know, I can't even remember exactly what it is, but it's something to do with cleaning a pipe, okay, in, in the oil and gas. Um, but I think that's really helped distill the knowledge across the organization so when people are put into a sales situation or even they're just delivering on a project, 
they're more easy, it's more easy for them to recognize a new opportunity and make someone else aware of it and, and help you know, grow a new deal. Um, regard to margin, um, I think any project where you're gonna come up with a reusable framework is gonna be exceptionally profitable. Um, you can deliver those as like a fixed bid project and you know, with very little effort put into actually delivering the project. Um, our rates are, I think, competitive in any industry, but I think if we go into a manufacturer and are speaking their lingo, our rates are almost never, ever questioned. They feel like they're getting extra value for the money that they're paying. Um, and the other thing we've done with the reusable frameworks, going back to that, is they become very affordable as a first project. And when you do a great job on a first project, all of a sudden they're like, hey, they did a great job on this first project. Let's give them a bigger project and a bigger one and a bigger one. And, and to some extent, that's where the profitability really comes in. You might make high margin on, on a small thing, but that's not gonna drive your long-term profitability. It's getting those larger and larger engagements. No, I think, I mean, I think you're right, Rick. You've got to scale and figure out how you're gonna scale. And one of the things that um, we've talked about a lot is, is do you look like you know what you're talking about, right? So if, if you say you're an expert in it, can you go see it? So one of the things that you will be hearing from Sherman and I, let's take a look at your website. Let's take a look at the emotional impact of your website because we've looked at a lot of your websites and they look a lot alike. And you say you're experts in certain things, but I can't see it. So it's, there are some very easy steps we can take to at least understand where you are today and tomorrow, what could happen, because that's where the thought leadership comes. You can build the practice, but they have to see and have some confidence that when they go to your site, you look like them, you know them, and you can help them with their problem. So um, one quick, uh, we're going to deviate just a little bit. We had a good question out in the audience, so thank you, Walter. Um, Rick, what platform has DMC used for its internal system? Is it D365, is it SharePoint, is it custom? How are, you know, you said drink your own champagne, right? Yeah. What does your champagne taste like? <laughs> okay, so uh, we use Exchange Online, Office 365. Uh, we use SharePoint, we use Dynamics 365. Um, those he are- was He was hesitant because he didn't want to say Salesforce in case he used Salesforce, <laughs> so I think that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. No, we use all, those in, all, all of those internally. With that said, we have customized the heck out of a lot of it. So it is meeting our needs uh, specifically, but that's something we can show to clients. We can tailor this, you know, SharePoint is such a, a blank canvas to start with. It's got some great features inside of it, but when you really want to deliver value and, you know, to your business processes to make them more efficient, you know, you've got to kind of customize those things, I think. No, it's great, great. So um, the next question, I, the next question I'd like to cover with you is, so, um, how have you captured the tribal knowledge? So you talked a little bit, we talked a little bit earlier about video blogs and things, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys do a lot of incensing your employees. But this is, these, these are activities, becoming industry experts and researching and understanding and being able to share that. How have you captured that industry knowledge, then disseminated that so that if people talk to you, the others in your company, that everybody can tell a similar story that you guys are in uh, experts in manufacturing? Yeah, so I'll go back to a little bit. We do these lunch and learns and they're weekly projects. We call it a weekly project status meeting. And it's all company, everybody's invited. We provide lunch for anybody who attends. And we go around the room and we talk about the projects that we're working on. Um, that again, gets people familiar with acronyms within the industry, um, specific types of solutions like a pig. Um, we also have kind of a, a dictionary of terms. Um, we do ongoing training for folks. Uh, we almost recruit exclusively out of college. Uh, probably 90% of our new employees come right out of school, which is probably a little bit unique as well. And so we've employed something called shadowing. And I think we do that also for some experienced hires where we'll take somebody experienced, they'll go on site, this person will just tag along and observe. We of course clear that with our clients before and let them know that somebody's gonna be coming along. But we do that for a while with somebody, and then we do reverse shadowing, where that person is actually doing the work, and they've got somebody more experienced backing them up behind them. And so that's, we found that to be very effective, especially for ramping up new employees. No, oh, it's awesome. So I'm glad you hit on that, Rick, because I was actually gonna call that out, because a couple things that are really cool about the culture of their office is they have the banners of every college, of every new hire going around. And one of the things Rick said is he goes, Initially, when we were hiring, you saw a lot of the same banners you see in every Chicago office. And now you're seeing 
what is it, Harvard and MIT and Cornell yeah. and these other schools where you're drawing in this talent and their culture is such that it lends itself toward that mentorship is huge because then you, you learn more when you teach and you also are given more guidance as opposed to just go out there and try to tell the story without any help and support. So I think you guys do a great job with that. Um, so hold on, you know, I, I think one of the things that we should, we should ask here, and I don't mean to, to interrupt you here, Jason, is just, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about seems like it's easy, it's no problem, you haven't run into any issues, you've just decided to do this, and wow, now we're the most successful company in the world. Help us understand some of the issues, some of the problems that you went through, some of the things that you figured out that's outside of just these, these great questions that give great insight to what works, what didn't work? Rick, help us understand that. Yeah, I think we went through a lot of what I'll call no charge projects <laughs> where, you know, we, we said we'd do something for a certain price and, you know, it didn't turn out that way. So I think you have to be prepared that some of these projects are going to go off the rails a little bit um, when you're expecting to bring something you've built before to the table and it's not going to meet the client's needs exactly. Um, so there's some expectation setting sometimes that we've learned that, okay, we've got a product, sort of. It's not a real software off-the-shelf product. Um, and so we've had to couch our message a little bit better that this is 80% of what you need. It's not everything. And I, do, I don't think we sold things quite the right way initially when we were doing this, but we've gotten a lot better at it. And so there's expectation setting that's come along with that. No, that's great. Well, and, and these guys have done it themselves. Sherman, how's that message resonating with you and your partners? Because I'm, I, I will have to say I have some willing skeptics and I have some people who are all in, but there's a lot of people who are still taking some uh, time to convince that industry and vertical is important. Well, I, I would tell you that it's, it is a, a thing that we continually talk about. And has it been adopted the way that, that uh, I've hopefully uh, wanted it to? No, it hasn't. Uh, but you know, the travesty of that is that, you know, I'm talking to, um, you know, partners uh, over and over again, and they're talking about leads and profitability and why can't they get more business and how do they do this? And the reality is let's, let's focus, let's reduce the business risk, let's reduce the amount of things that we're offering and actually be a lot more targeted. Now, Eric did have a good question. Now, Eric, I, I want to just uh, bring it back to you here. What was your question that you were, you were just talking about? Yeah, so I, what I wanted to ask Rick was, uh, from a business ownership, you know, leadership standpoint, um, how did you absorb the, the risk uh, going into that, that vertical? You talked about it a, a second ago that you, know, you had some projects that uh, were perhaps not as successful. Obviously, that, that becomes a challenge from a, a leadership and ownership standpoint. So how do you manage that? Yeah, I, I'd say if we had to do it over again, we certainly would have prepared, been more prepared for those no charge projects, as, as I refer to them. Um, so there, you have to be prepared to invest for a few months, it might be six months, before you really hit your stride and you're able to successfully market and deliver the solutions that you're building, um, or also grow your knowledge. Sometimes you get very far along the sales process and then you meet somebody who is a real business expert or has very deep industry knowledge and they challenge you and you, you can't quite meet them tit for tat. And um, that's something to be prepared that you'll get some, some fish that'll slip away a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's-, that's Thanks, kind of no, that, 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 was, that was really good. All right, so let's go ahead and get into our next section, which is uh, profitability. All right, so Rick, uh, based on the success, what industry specialization or solution comes next for you? And then we'll bring it over to Eric and see what his thoughts are. Yeah, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, just around the fact that, you know, engineering's a natural uh, professional for us outside of manufacturing. Uh, they're they're kind of tightly coupled, so that was an easy, uh, a small jump, I guess. Um, professional services, like I mentioned, I think that is really where we're going to go next. And we've been, you know, we've got our own kind of time reporting tool that we've built that fully integrates with with all the other systems at DMC. 
And with regard to that, I think we have an opportunity to productize some of that and, and bring it to our customers, show it as a demonstration. We've got 80% of this thing built that should fit your needs, um, as well as kind of resourcing, staffing. We have these challenges. I'm sure a lot of you folks on the phone do too. And that's been uh, a huge challenge, but we've put some good tools in place. And I think we're going to start bringing those to the table. Um, there's also just, you know, Dynamics 365 is a growth area for us as well. And they're starting to add those applications inside of it, like field service and project service automation. Um, we're actually going to take a look at project service automation as uh, a tool we might take on internally, uh, maybe replace some of the custom things we've done. Because as we've grown, we kind of outgrown our own custom tools too. Yep. Well, you know, Rick, I have a question. When you're talking about the D365 piece and, and trying to build your own tools, one of the challenges I've found with partners and with um, customers is once you customize, sometimes you start to tweak and change and it's hard to upgrade and change into the future. How have you guys tried to scale? Because I feel like, you know, we've talked about the package solutions and that's not really, that that's not a huge part of your culture to have pre-packaged, right? but maybe 65% packaged or some of those things. How have you looked at it so that you don't over-customize and then have a difficult upgrade, uh, upgrade path as you go in the future, or it just evolves over time and it doesn't look like what it started, so it's really hard to try to make some changes and shifts? Yeah, I think we learned a lot. When we upgraded SharePoint from 2010 to 2013, back when we were on-premise, um, the SharePoint framework and the SharePoint object model was evolving and, and the ability to do add-ins has helped immensely where you're kind of building things outside of the platform that are easy to integrate. So Microsoft's helped a lot in that respect uh, in that we can leave the out-of-the-box functionality as is, perform upgrades to new things, and these add-ins just kind of continue to work within, within these platforms. So we've looked at it from that eye of, after we went through that one pain, an extremely painful project that was internally, um, and learned from that, and we look at every solution from that standpoint. We don't want other clients to have to go through what we went through. Yep. No, that's good, that's good. We, we do have a question, um, again, Walter has a question from the group, and he's talking about free projects. When and how to invest, when does it make sense, how have you chosen when to invest in terms of free work that you're giving as part of a project? Yeah. Um, usually we wait for at least three projects to have come along, and then we'll say that's a pattern, and then we'll take a look and we'll, we'll do a little bit of a, a survey of some existing customers. Is this a pain point for you, or is this something that would make your lives better? So just kind of pass, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not scientific research, if you will, but it's, it's more of a, you know, uh, ad hoc kind of once we see a few people confirm what we think is going to be something we can build as a re reusable solution, we'll invest. Okay. Well, and, and I think that's that's the other thing we've talked about too. You have higher margin if you have reusable solutions that can get you farther down the path. And then, you know, I was, I was talking to one of my other partners and they were saying, you know, I asked them, I said, why did you shorten up all the services dollars? You're a consulting company. And they said, we feel like there's projects we couldn't do or we couldn't do in time, or we couldn't stay within budget if we didn't have these reusable pieces. And so we look at it and we sell it actually as we can do more, we can accept the risk of a fixed bid project and actually execute it with this framework. Whereas otherwise, if you're building it all from scratch, you don't know, right? Some things may or may not work. Something we run into quite a bit is the, the prospect has a, found a software solution that does what they want. And it's gonna be cheaper to do for that, you know, to buy this product but it doesn't meet their needs 100%. So it becomes this trade-off, and when we're able to bring a reusable framework to the table, it's not the same as starting from scratch and building a 100% custom solution. So we're able to be much more competitive, and they're willing to spend more if they're going to get everything that they want. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. How do, you, how, do you, how do you calculate total cost of your sales, you know, um, when it comes to building packages, and looking at industry specific verticalization. I think that's something that I, I think when you're creating packages, you really got to figure out what that is. So I'd be interested in hearing, you know, your thoughts on that, Rick. So yeah, when we before we embark upon, you know, let's kind of productize the solution, 
Um, we basically run it like we would run a, a client project. So we put together the work plan, which includes sales and marketing activities. There's collateral to be built. There's website uh, content to be built, uh, AdWord campaigns that are going to go along with it. So we take a look at that, and then we take a look at when this is done, what do we think a typical project is going to cost? How many of these are we going to be able to do in a given quarter, the next quarter, and so on and so on? So. Uh, you know, we, we take a look at it that way and look at the cost versus what we're going to get in revenue from it and then decide, is this, does this make sense? Yeah. So not every idea that we see a pattern, we're going to go do it. We do that analysis up front first. Hey, so Rick, how much are you guys spending? Because we've talked about this in other shows, but given that we're still in the profitability piece, how much are you spending on marketing right now? <sighs> well, a percent word? of revenue. So not, not dollar amount, but like two, four, five, Probably six. a little over three. Okay. So a little over three, which is 3%. a little over 3%, okay. okay? And so, and we know that what we've talked about is the industry leading partners, and this is not to put you in a category, okay. but are really looking at five, 6% or more, right? However, I think they have a very mature marketing organization. And the other thing I think that they're not doing, because I had this discussion yesterday, they're not waiting for Microsoft to fund their marketing. They're not waiting for just vendors to tell them where to spend their money. And they're making investments because as we're talking about, and we talked a little bit about the buyer 2.0, there's a lot that it needs to be invested in marketing and they don't even have salespeople, right? So they're empowering everybody else to sell. Now, maybe they should have salespeople and that's something they would do in the future, but with their marketing and how they're empowering people to sell, that takes the cost of sale down because you're not paying for a person who has to figure out what you do. You have people you're already paying to execute the work who are selling for you and building that brand. And, I, and here's a, there's a soft cost on marketing that isn't captured in that 3%, and that's content generation. So we encourage yep. all of our engineers and consultants to author blogs and case studies. We put together what we call lunch and do's. Again, we'll buy lunch if anybody comes, and it might take three or four sessions to get your blog finished or your case study finished, but we push it to our engineers and consultants to author this content. So we'd probably need to add another headcount or two to try to generate that, but it's not going to be as genuine a content anyway. So I think we're, right. we're much more efficient and effective by having individuals author their own content for the website. Well, and, and I so, think that's great. Yeah, so, so, good question. I, I, would, I would actually add that, that actually the most profitable partners are, are actually spending between 10 and 12% of their total or their gross annual revenue. Uh, as well as if you take a look at uh, just think of this, okay? And this isn't a specific number, but just think about this: McDonald's, right? How much do they spend uh, of their uh, of their gross annualized revenue? And it's probably anywhere between 18 and 22 percent. That's amazing, right? But they're doing very much the same thing. They're getting people to come to them to to come to them to buy a burger. You're doing a lot of the same things. You're having people come to you to actually invest in your in your services. Now, Eric, what do you, what do you think about that? Do you, do you think we should be stuck at the three percent, the five percent, or should we actually make that change to get to twelve percent? Well, I think we've talked about this in some of the, the past shows that I, I totally agree with you that I think, you know, realistically for for smaller, you know, SMB type pipe partners, you've got to realistically be in that 10% range uh, and, and get yourself to that level. Uh, and to kind of bring that full circle to what you said a, a moment ago, I can, you know, use this story. If you look at the some of the, the large franchise organizations that are out there, and this is something that I talk about with, with my clients, is uh, organizations like Meineke, the, the muffler and, and automotive repair shop, for example, uh, exactly to your point, Sherman, they actually require and charge uh, their franchisees 10%. So it's 10% of every dollar that gets spent at a Meineke goes right back into marketing uh, automatically as part of the, the franchise fees for the, for the organization. Uh, I think that's a great example uh, to, to take a look at. And so for partners today, that should be your, your goal. And that's what's going to drive your business. That's going to what's going to move you forward uh, in terms of, of growing your organization. Now, doing that and doing it more effectively by doing it in vertical markets, like we've been talking about today, that's so much the better. Because we also know that it's actually statistically on the order of about ten times harder to market to the general market out there than it is to market to a vertical market and see success out of it. So by going into those verticals, you're actually going to, over time, uh, 
drive more value, drive more revenue for your organization uh, with a lower overall cost per lead uh, by going into the verticals. So those are things to, to just be cognizant of as well. All right, back to you, Jason. So one thing I want to touch on, and this, this question came up, Carrie, thank you for submitting this question around the 10%. Now, the one thing I would love to set a bar out there of 10% spend on marketing dollars, but some of my partners don't know what they spend. And the ones who do typically guess it's around like two to 3%. So I, I, but I think it's good to set a bar, but then the 10%, I love it that Carrie's talking about that. Like, does that include human resources? So I do think it's important to have dedicated people who are focused on the messaging because curating the content takes a while. Even if somebody's blogging about it, how do you get curated messaging that they can go blog about? And so I do think the human factor is in that area. And the other thing is, I think this is funny. So we had a, we had a session with executives and uh, the person leading the session, he goes in and he said, um, he said, who are you related to? And one of his small partners, he goes, because you're in marketing, right? And she's like, yeah, how did you know it's related to somebody? Because that's what people do. They hire family to work in marketing, right? But you wouldn't hire family to do service delivery necessarily just because they're family. But so marketing is a critical engine that finding the right person who can take and distill technical writing, take and drive a business message, and then help everybody else drive it through the organization, I think is key. So would you say, so this is the question we're going to end with, based on all that we talked about, do you think if I pulled one of your folks aside, like how comfortable are they talking to me about what you guys do and what you're best at? And is there anybody in your organization that you'd have concerns if somebody like stopped them and said, what does DMC do? Yeah, that's actually- And, and that could be the CEO. It could be the top people in the organization. <laughs> you can admit that too. I think he's got case. that handled. But uh, no, I, I, I think 90 plus percent would get a B plus or an A. Awesome. I really do. I, we, the, one of our new employee courses is what does DMC do? And as part of that, we do a little bit of role play, have people do elevator pitch practice. Um, we have something to start from, but we ask everybody to make it their own so that they're very comfortable explaining what DMC does. That's awesome. Perfect. Well, um, I'll shoot it back over to you, Sherman. I think we got a segment coming, right? Yeah, we sure do. We've got the partner back office with TNT, Thomas and Terry. Come on in, partners. TNT emulating Ferris Bueller's day off. We're coming to you from the Shield store in Fargo, North Dakota. We've got some great action items coming for you today. Thomas, what's on the agenda? Yeah, so we're going to be going over GDPR resources, the upcoming GDPR Executive Summit, H2 Azure Incentives, and CSP Non-Profit Schemes. So we're going to see you in two. All right, take it away. So if you remember back in Inspire, um, there was in one of the keynotes they announced um, in the compliance section uh, of GDPR. So GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, es essentially what you need to know is that if you have any customers that are part of the European Union overseas, this May um, of 2018, this the GDPR will take into effect. So we gathered some resources, um, some articles, white papers, and even information from our trust center on how you can get prepared, how you can be in the know, and how you can ensure that your customers are compliant um, regarding to their data and their storage. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Jason or myself, and we'd be happy to jump on a one-off call shoot us an email, you have our contact information. All right, partners, so as I mentioned in the previous slide, on May 2018, uh, a European privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation is due to take effect. So GDPR imposes new rules on companies, government agencies, non-for-profits, and other organizations that offers goods and services. Good news is that there is a Microsoft GDPR Partner Summit uh, taking place from April 3rd to the 4th in Redmond, Washington. So some things that you're gonna take from this event, uh, it's a two day event as I mentioned, and the first day will um, cover business opportunity sessions, and day two is technology and tools. Uh, the individuals that should attend this event are VP level practice leads, 
business strategy leaders, tech leads, senior technology strategy leaders within your company. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to uh, myself, Jason, Terry, or Sherman about this summit. Um, we'd be happy to just jump on a one-off call and just talk to you more about GDPR and how it affects you and why this is important. Um, for more information about this event, click the registration link below. And off to the next slide. Okay, the slide I want to cover today is the CSP H2 incentives and offers. As we start to close out Q3 and we're starting to move into Q4, I wanted to just make sure everyone has the latest H2 incentives and offerings. So below here are two link links that are going to cover customer offers, direct and indirect partner incentives, managed partner offers, and then also some resources and tools. Uh, also, I wanted to note that funding opportunities are not guaranteed. As we move closer into year end, those funds may or may not be available. So as you uh, work those into your opportunities, uh, just keep in the back of your mind that those funds may or may not be available if you're pushing it to the end of the year. Questions, please let us know. Thanks. The last slide on our agenda today is CSP for nonprofits. We're really excited to provide additional details to the announcement that Sherman shared a few weeks ago on our Friday call um, regarding several different changes that are kicking off March 1st. Uh, below are a couple of links that are going to provide a deeper dive into those details, but please let us know if you have any questions. And also it's going to touch on Office 365 nonprofit SKUs that are going to be launching in CSP on April 1st. So then great and exciting news that you guys can utilize moving forward. And again, we're going to keep you updated as those things uh, start happening. Thanks. Hey partners, thank you so much for joining us uh, this Friday. We're going to see you next Friday for another action packed back office. Fun fact, I spoke to Deb here at the Shield Story and he informed me that North Dakota is the least business state in the United States. And so we need you to come here and visit us. I wonder why. See ya. Bye. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Terry and Thomas. TNT. All right. So uh, last thing, a quick, couple quick announcements. Uh, one. Uh, please register for Inspire. If you haven't done so already, you really, really need to. Uh, we are going to be there. Number two, uh, we have a uh, an Azure, a Global Azure Boot Camp actually uh, in um, San Francisco uh, coming up. And actually, uh, Jason's going to go ahead and, and post that link uh, in the actual invite. Please go ahead and click on that right away. Um, there's a lot of open seats for it. It's going to be an incredible conference, uh, you know, kind of mini conference kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, really will be great for your engineers. Uh, if you happen to be in Northern California, if you're in Southern California, you know, send them up there as well. All right, with that being said, you know, what I would like to always do here is, you know, just refresh everyone with, with our guests, but to allow them to be able to contact our guests, uh, you know, when they need to. Uh, and I apologize, Rick, I, we, we, we double ended your name and I am so sorry, uh, but, it is the great Rick, <laughs> Rick writes, Rick writes, <laughs> give him a call uh, when you get a chance or send him an email. Uh, everyone here is here to help, uh, here to, to drive uh, and help drive business for you. Uh, you have your partner technical strategist for both teams uh, here, Tim Tetrick, Jeff Stofall, and then you have myself, Jason, Terry, Thomas, everyone you need to contact. You know, we like to land this plane on time. And, and today uh, from, uh, you know, Irvine, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and thank you, Eric. I really appreciate you joining us today, um, you know, with this. And then back to, to Jason, just to say thank you very much. And then we'll, we'll end the show, Jason. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks. It was a pleasure to be here. Appreciate being invited. All thanks, right. Chairman. All right, sounds good. Every Friday from 9 to 10, make sure you come here or send somebody uh, to this show because we do have a lot of uh, announcements to do this. So please don't miss it. All right, have a great day. Bye-bye.
Hey there, my name is Sherman Crancer, and I'm the Senior Partner Channel Development he uh, Manager here at Microsoft and the host of the panel, Strategies from the Titans of Sales and Industry. If you're interested in understanding how you can build large margins through packages, if you're interested in how to create differentiation uh, within the marketplace, or simply uh, you want to understand the latest cutting edge sales and marketing techniques, make sure you join us each week uh, on Fridays from 9 to 10 a.m. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.